everyone, this is Claire Curry, Science Librarian at the University of Oklahoma. In our Options for Remote STEM Research Series, this is video 6, a recording of a webinar from May 29th, 2020 by Dr. Michael Patton of the Oklahoma Biological Survey on conducting a meta-analysis. This computer. All right, so we have started recording. So I want to welcome everybody to our second live event for the STEM Work From Home series. My name is Claire Curry. Um, I think I know everybody here, but I'll just go ahead and do this introduction. Um, so I'm a science librarian here at the University of Oklahoma Libraries. And we are honored today to have our guest speaker, Dr. Michael Patton, a presidential professor at the Oklahoma Biological Survey and in the Department of Biology. We can see you shaking your head there and rolling your eyes, Michael. You shut off my video. <laughs> No, not yet. <laughs> um, he's very distinguished and also very humble. <laughs> um, so I have been honored to know Michael for a long time. He's my PhD advisor and Michael knows tons of stuff about statistics. So we've asked him to come talk to us today about meta-analysis as a good way to get some research going that is not going to depend on you going out into the field or the lab. You can collect papers and do the stuff from the comfort of wherever you are. <laughs> Um, during these interesting pandemic times or other times as well. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Michael. So your PowerPoint is not currently up right now. Um, so if you want to bring that up. Yep, there we go. So we can see your screen now. Um, so I will let you say any other introductory remarks, let people know um, how you want to do questions here, and I will turn it over to you, Michael. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video. And after you say your introductory stuff, I'll go ahead and stop your video to you, Michael. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody. Um, it was obviously a bit of a challenge to condense what I've done as a 16-week course into something that's going to amount to perhaps 45 minutes. Um, but the goal uh, that I set for myself today was to give a broad introduction to what meta-analysis is and also, Claire asking me to do this basically made me step back and, and forced me to put it into what I think uh, is a good context of why we do these in the first place. Um, and then I'll walk through uh, the various steps that are involved in conducting a meta-analysis, uh, walk through a very quick example of one that um, we published just last year, and then wrap up. And um, I guess normally uh, questions are reserved for the end, but I tend to prefer to have discussions rather than simply talking at people. So if I say something ridiculous as we go or something that's unclear or whatever it may be, um, feel free to interrupt, ask a question um, as we proceed. So and with again, that, I will I will be monitoring the chat. So um, yeah, and you could just read out the questions when you if you get anything in the yeah, chat. Yeah. So if, yeah, if y'all see want to say anything in chat, uh, just let me know and I will read it out so Michael can can get that. All right. I will go ahead and turn your video off for you, Michael. Okay. So whoa, it's not letting me advance. Oh wait. There we go. Can everyone still hear me? <laughs> Is that a yes? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Well, here's, here's the context that I, I guess I've thought about um, for meta-analysis for a number of years now. Um, it has to do with how we perform science. And I'm specifically thinking for those of you who have uh, taken the plunge and decided to read uh, Thomas Kuhn's um, treatise on the structure of scientific revolutions. Um, for those of you who don't know who Kuhn is, he was somebody who got a PhD in theoretical physics. And then as far as I know, didn't work a single day in his life as a physicist. Instead, he got really interested in how science worked, published this book uh, in the 1960s, I believe, maybe it was the 1950s initially, and it created a huge sensation. Um, but a lot of it has to do with what, he termed as normal science. And so here's a little graphic that uh, just sort of outlines what that may be, along with examples of a geocentric and a heliocentric models for um, the solar system. 
Kuhn's notion was basically, we have these paradigms under which we work. We don't simply go out and say, I'm gonna do this today, and not, it's not as if it's unguided. We're, we always have some idea in mind that there's some theoretical expectation, there's some uh, idea about how everything works. That is the paradigm under which we work. And at some point, as we're working in this paradigm, all of the work we do within that is what he termed as normal science. And I know it sounds kind of sad, but that's what most of us do all the time. Um, it's what most every scientist who's ever lived has done um, with the bulk of, of his or her career. When we're working under particular paradigms, and maybe it's the geocentric uh, model of the solar system, we begin to observe anomalies. In this case, it might be the retrograde um, uh, motion of Mars, and it looks as if it's going backward at some point rather than. Uh, completely completing the circle around the sun, and, and that's an anomaly around the earth, I should say. As we accumulate those anomalies, as we observe these, we keep track of them, at some point when there are too many anomalies, we reach what's called a crisis. And then there is what uh, Kuhn defined as, a revol as revolutionary science. And that's where there's this massive shift in how we view what's going on in the world, and we enter a new paradigm. In this case, you know, in this example, it's we adopt a heliocentric model, and it turns out that that explains the observations, it gets rid of those anomalies, everything still works, and we're now in a different paradigm under which normal science is conducted yet again. The question is, what does it mean to be abnormal? So, in other words, have you identified an anomaly or not? And if I were to bring this back to, uh, some of you may recognize this example, but it's a particular favorite of mine. If we were to bring this back into um, just our day-to-day -day normal science and how it works, let's say we consider this question uh, with the massing data on soccer, football, if you prefer to call it that, which is frankly, a better name for it. Um, and a red card is when a player has done something that is considered to be a, a foul on another player, something like that, and could be removed. And, and there was this sociological question of whether or not soccer referees were more likely to present red cards to players with darker skin tones. And here are the results from 29 different analyses. Um, basically, you can consider this we'll just pretend for the sake of this argument, that these are 29 different studies that were done to try to answer that same question. And you can see where I've labeled at the top, yes and no, basically an answer to that question. And one of the things you'll notice, and these are just some of the examples in here, we have probably no in some cases, but you really can't say for sure because the uncertainty is too high and it overlaps that middle ground. There are some probably yeses. There are a whole suite of definitely yeses. I would argue that we don't know what to do in these situations. Um, and that's really where we start to head with the whole notion of meta-analyses, is if we're faced with this and you pick up one study that says, no, there's no effect of this, you pick up another study that says, yes, there's definitely effect of this, there may be another that says, well, we really couldn't say, we found no evidence either way. It's then on us to say, well, what does this mean? Are these anomalies? Is everything just proceeding as normal? Do we make assumptions that, um, well, because we happen to find a particular study first, that then that's the way it works? So we then ask the question of who is correct. And there are various ways to find this out. Um, there are techniques to combine pr probabilities, vote count, narrative reviews, meta-analysis, um, which may or may not be the topic of this uh, discussion, and synthetic reviews. So combining probabilities is a statistical approach, and it's where you actually take the results across a suite of studies that examine the same hypothesis, 
to find an overall p-value. This technique has been around since the 1930s. Um, it's surprisingly little used, uh, but it does focus on the notion that you're interested most of all in the p-value and not much else. Vote counting is particularly popular. Um, it is like it sounds. You basically tally, in this case, say, positive neutral and negative results to see which one wins. So in the example I presented, we might say, well, more people said yes or, or found yes than no, so we're gonna conclude that that's the answer. There are all kinds of problems with this particular uh, simple technique, but it is super simple. You could do a narrative review, um, which basically means you write a story. And obviously it's not just any story, you're supposed to write one that basically is in your professional judgment what you think is happening. There's the meta-analysis, and then there are synthetic reviews, which are often combined with the preceding, um, but they could stand alone, and they're typically meant to be a synthesis of all available research in a particular field. If in the example I gave, there were only those 29 studies, you can conduct a synthetic review where you said, well, the bulk of the evidence was on this, blah, 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 but you don't actually do anything that would resemble what a meta-analysis is, which is a quantitative approach as opposed to qualitative that allows us to integrate um, in a very systematic way the results of prior studies. And this is basically designed then that we can see what the overall, uh, what our overall conclusion might be. And this is particular valuable if we're really trying to identify what we might think are anomalies or, or something that uh, went wrong. Um, maybe it turns out that uh, they didn't so much. And there are various reasons for that that I'll touch upon briefly. These are labor intensive. And there's this little figure that I presented here that appeared in a review paper six years ago that is meant to show a benefit to effort ratio on the y-axis. And as you can see, the idea of vote counting is very little effort, but the benefits are also fairly low. Systematic reviews, um, by contrast, are actually pretty labor intensive because in principle, you're supposed to find every single uh, study that dealt with the particular issue. Meta-analyses are a lot of work, um, but you can view those as, you don't have to have, um, all of the available studies, you can simply have a sample. Picture it as going out and doing field work. If you are interested in um, guppies, if you're interested in Eastern bluebirds, um, volcano juncos, whatever the case may be, you do not need to find every single individual to be able to say something about what's going on in those systems. The same is true then of a meta-analysis that you can simply find a sufficient sample in the literature to get estimates of what you're interested in. In these cases, the, what you're interested in is typically an effect size. Now, this is a word you'll hear people like me tossing around quite a bit, but um, I continue to lament that uh, effect size is not used nearly as often as it ought to be in the scientific literature. There's still a very large focus on p-values and rejecting null hypotheses. But an effect size is a quantitative metric of a particular phenomenon's magnitude. It's basically um, how much something matters. And there are various classes uh, that these can be. You can look at the difference between groups or among groups. Um, so a, a standard way that uh, you might be familiar with is Cohen's D, for example. Um, and, and you can do that, say, after you do a t-test, and you may, have, may or may not have found that uh, you rejected the null hypothesis, but you have an additional interest in just how big that difference was. That's where the effect size comes in. The Cohen's D can get you there. These can be correlations. They can be categorical associations. I would argue they can also be specific parameters. So if you're interested in, say, dispersal distance in a particular group of organisms, you could calculate that dispersal distance across a suite of organisms 
and basically try to see what that um, value is. If you are interested in examining, say, the uh, theory of island biogeography, um, you might be interested to know what the exponent is of the particular area relationship associated. And across a suite of studies, you can get estimates of that particular parameter. The steps of a meta-analysis, um, like it or not, you're going to have to develop a research question. And then you search literature. Um, you select studies from that. Now, I'll touch upon all these more, so don't worry about just this quick overview. You extract data from the ones that you did select. Then you conduct the actual meta-analysis. And then, of course, um, it's only any good as true of anything we do if we write it up and share it with others. When you develop the research question, um, this really does need to be a question that has quantitative results if you're going to do a meta-analysis. If you plan to just do a, uh, some sort of systematic review, um, you can use qualitative uh, statements, qualitative data, but you really can't use those in a meta-analysis unless you figure out a way to put those into numbers. So that's something you're gonna, you know, when you think about the kinds of questions that you can develop, you need to think about whether or not you can find quantitative results. There's the search of the relevant literature. And um, I know Liz can speak to this, who's, who's on right now. It, it, it's slow and it's tedious. It can be mind numbing because the first few searches you put in, you might end up getting 80,000 results back. So you slowly refine search terms. You slowly try to whittle down um, the vast amount that you will get back. It's, it can be particularly bad on Google Scholar. Google Scholar's free, which is terrific. You don't have to be logged in through the library. It's not a subscription service the way Web of Science or Scopus are. Um, but you will get an enormous number of hits. And you will then also have to decide at this point if you want to restrict uh, say the journals you're searching, if you want to include um, master's theses or doctoral dissertations, if you want to include gray literature reports um, or reports that were prepared that are scientific, but they were prepared by um, basically NGOs or, or uh, scientific bodies. Maybe the National Academies put out a report and you want to include it. All of those decisions have to be made. You could also get raw data from people. Um, so don't assume this is just uh, specifically published literature. This is pretty broad. I would like but, to chime in here, Michael, as well, that uh, us librarians are always happy to help with this process. And we have helped people before working on these search terms. So if you're having trouble getting what you need, um, please do contact one of us and we'll be happy to help. And, and I have process. a plug for you in the end, Claire, about that. Oh, okay, so. thank you. <laughs> I just wanted, you said co comments as we go along. So I didn't oh, yeah, yeah, know that we can help. Good. It's, it's a very good thing to emphasize because this is exactly the kind of, uh, the kind of task that the research librarians can help with. Yeah, and it's always fun for us too. So don't feel like you're inconveniencing us because then we get to see mm -hmm. cool literature that we wouldn't otherwise be, be looking at. So do get in touch. Then you actually, once you have found this massive number, potentially, you have to um, basically comb through it to find out exactly which ones you are going to keep for your analysis. This is also slow and tedious. It's less mind numbing, I would argue, because you actually have to think. Um, but you do have to go through, say, the abstracts and maybe the, the methods and results sections of all of these different papers to find out exactly um, where everything stands. You may have to uh, exclude studies, for example, if they, if you're specifically interested in a treatment versus control situation and, and you find out that they've reported some particular response, but there's no reference, there's no control, and you really can't do anything with that. It might be great for a qualitative analysis, 
but for a quantitative one such as the meta-analysis, it's, it's unhelpful. And in fact, this particular um, graphic is from a review paper that appeared by Jessica Gurevich and con, uh, colleagues uh, just a couple years ago in Nature. Gurevich, uh, if you don't know, is a quantitative ecologist at Stony Brook University and basically has built her career on doing largely statistical things and has been at the forefront of bringing meta-analyses into ecology and evolutionary biology. Uh, the technique itself was largely started in medicine because there might have been, say, a particular drug that had a dozen or 15 or 20 different clinical trials, all of which had different results. And at some point, folks wanted to know, well, does this drug work or not? And there were these techniques developed to come up with an overall, say, effect of the treatment, in this case, an effect of that drug, and getting at that effect size this way. But this is how they summarized it. You get records from databases, perhaps from other sources. So maybe you have colleagues who can provide data. Um, you have to remove duplicate records. That is trickier than it sounds. It's one thing, obviously, to see that, oh, well, I found this same paper twice. That's a piece of cake. But there are a surprising number of papers that have been published out there that use the same data sets. And so you, if you were to include results from both papers, it turns out you're basically including the same answers. Um, they might have simply been uh, placed in a different context, um, that sort of thing. So you screen all of these, you exclude them, then you have to look through all of the full text papers, exclude the ones that don't include all of the data you need, um, that sort of thing. They happen to put the order of this is the, you then decide on what you're gonna include in the qualitative synthesis, and then what you include in the quantitative. I understand why they did that, because the qualitative one could be broader, as I already mentioned. You could find papers that are relevant to making some sort of qualitative statements about the particular effect of something, but you can't actually get the numbers from it. I would nonetheless switch these to the reason being is that my own view is that in the systematic reviews, um, we try a lot harder to find all of the relevant literature, whereas for a meta-analysis, it simply needs to be a sufficient sample of the literature. And then there's the fun part of the data. Um, I would recommend, and I say this from uh, my own personal experience and the agony associated with that, you don't want to have to revisit a long list of selected papers because it turns out you realized that there was some bit that you needed to pull out that you didn't. And then you have to go back and look at every single one of those papers to find those bits. Um, it's bad enough having to go through them all, pull out the bits of info, um, try the best you can to quality check the data as you go. This is really super slow and tedious and mind numbing. There's no much, not much way around that. It can be frustrating. Um, I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but it's just the reality of it. In some cases, you know, it's going to be really easy if you're looking for, say, a mean response and you want the associated standard deviation and the, um, say, the sample size for maybe the treatment group and the control group. And maybe you found a paper that reports all of those in very clear terms. Maybe it's even just in a little table. You can just pull those out and enter them into your spreadsheet piece of cake. In other studies, you may see none of that, or you may just see the means reported, or they might be in a figure. And the fact that they're in the figure alone doesn't mean you can't get the data. There are programs, software such as Data Thief, um, that I've used, and it works pretty well, that you can say, um, I've used it to where I've called in a scatter plot from a published paper. And then by putting in the axes dimensions of that scatter, I was able to get uh, basically good approximations of where each of those points were. And then I could add my own data to that published, um, the, the published data. And because I wasn't able to get it otherwise, the, it, the paper had come out 25 years ago. Um, and I didn't have access to the raw data. And so 
you can do that sort of thing as well. Again, it's slow, it's tedious, but the whole idea is you're trying to amass a sample size. The analysis, and this is obviously the analysis that's part of the meta-analysis, um, is I would argue the easy part because once you've reached this step, most of the hard work is behind you. Most of the work that you do will be uh, digging through the literature, screening out the literature, entering the data, quality checking the data. If you do have to pull out data from figures, for example, using Data Thief and all of that, it, it takes time. Once you have all of the data and everything looks good, uh, cranking through the numbers isn't, it really isn't so bad. I do have an although there. One is there's math. And I know this tends to freak people out. And you know that's one of the joys of putting together a slide like this is people look at it and I know your eyes are already glazing over. But part of this is to emphasize these are four of the most commonly used measures of effect size. And I want to emphasize that they're really fairly straightforward equations. The top one, the response ratio, really is just the mean treatment effect divided by the mean control effect, and then you take the natural log of that. That's the entire thing. There's nothing more complicated than that. You will note, though, that it doesn't include anything about variation. It is simply the means. Cohen's D does include variation. You can see that in the denominator. That's the sample standard deviation. It's assumed to be the same for both of your groups that you're examining. That's the same assumption you would have to meet for ANOVA, for t-tests. That's the homogeneity of variance assumption. So Cohen's D is built around that same assumption. Um, the Pearson's correlation, you know, the formula that's on the right looks maybe particularly ugly, but it really is just the covariance um, divided by the product of the standard deviations of the, of the two um, variables. And the hedges D might look particularly hairy, but I just want to point out that you'll immediately see that the, um, well, the bars dropped off of the top, but those are supposed to be the means. So it's just like the Cohen's D, but the bottom is the pooled variance. And there's also a correction for um, the inflation from the sample sizes. And so that's all that is in the denominator is the pooled um, standard deviation. And that gives you a better estimate of some difference that you'll see. A larger issue, and you will need to uh, deal with this when you sit down to do your own meta-analysis, is publication bias. Now, you may be lucky in that you've decided to uh, uh, basically come up with a question that you can find sufficient literature that address what interests you, but it, they really weren't specific tests of, say, null hypotheses that tend to make or break whether or not a paper gets even submitted for publication. So go back to that dispersal distance argument um, or, or example that I gave that you could say that you know, the vast majority of people aren't going to care if a particular, say, dragonfly disperses 500 meters or 600 meters. They're simply going to report their result. Um, and you're not going to run into this problem with those situations. It also may be that there are specific uh, data that you can find that relate to a particular idea, but the, I, but the study wasn't couched in terms of that idea. Um, and which means you may be able to pull out all of those data, and even if they're non-significant or whatever else, they're, they're all there for you. In other circumstances, um, if there's a particular hot topic and somebody, you know, some group is going out and publishing results and another group's doing it, another group's doing it, there's a long-standing problem. This paper came out in 1996, so we're talking about almost a quarter century ago, that basically there's this file drawer problem. This was identified in biology a number of years ago. It's something that occurs in all 
scientific fields because of the emphasis we place on significance tests. And the idea is basically that if you do a study and you think it's a perfectly legitimate study, maybe you add water to uh, a plot of grasses and, and you assume that it's going to have some particular effect and it doesn't, then you may think, oh, well, there's no point in me trying to publish this. But the fact that you found no effect is really important if we want to understand the true effect of something in a system. There are ways you can identify this, and this is, by the way, is just an example from that particular paper of the number of studies that um, report non-significant results re relative to the ones that reported some sort of statistical significance. And you can see that it's a tiny fraction. It's, it's less than 10%. And I said, this is a problem for doing meta-analyses. We can identify them though. We can um, construct these things called funnel plots, for example. This is just one way to do it, but this is a particularly common way. And I also think it has intuitive appeal. You basically just plot the effect and that line that goes, um, the vertical line in the center is basically just to mean that, mean that zero point where you basically have no effect right there in the middle. And then you have some measure of the size of the study. Maybe this is sample size. Maybe, maybe it's an estimate of precision, which is related to the sample size, but some sort of metric like that on the y-axis. And then if you don't have any real bias in literature from publication bias, you should see a figure such as the one on the left. If you do see publication bias, you'll see something um, that's on the right, where there's this big hole where all the negative studies really ought to have been. There are ways around this too. Um, one of a number of examples that's been developed, but again, this one's particularly straightforward and uh, has received not only a lot of attention and support, but has been used a lot, is there's this trim and fill method um, that you can basically fill in where points ought to be. You're basically sampling from a, a sort of notion of what the distribution ought to have been and fill in those points. And I would say don't fret over which method to use. If you want to use trim and fill, that's great. The bottom line that I'm just trying to emphasize here is you really ought to look at whether or not publication bias has affected your findings. And it matters because when you look at this, if you didn't fill in those points, your estimate of the mean effect is actually biased upward. So you might conclude that there's a larger effect than there really is in real life. Whereas if you backfill, you fill in those points or do other, some other sort of correction, it's centered at zero and you're able to say something again. That's a good thing. There's another kind of bias and I'm not, again, not trying to scare anybody away. Um, and perhaps you've seen this paper or ones like it, um, but uh, Iodinus in this case worked out uh, just a simple two by two uh, contingency table mathematics to demonstrate that because of the way we go about doing our null hypothesis testing, that a massive chunk of what ends up getting published uh, is subject to type one error, which is when we conclude that we rejected a null hypothesis but we shouldn't have concluded that. And you'll notice number two in the list of the six reasons he said you could see this is because of small effect sizes. I would argue that this is something that a meta-analysis could, not necessarily will, but could help overcome if you find a sufficient sample in the literature, any studies that or subjected to type one error might then disappear and they won't have much overall effect in how you, um, what sort of conclusions you reach. 
So just in case you thought I forgot, I didn't. We're still talking about those six steps to produce a, a meta-analysis. The last step is to write it up. Um, I recognize uh, up front in dealing with colleagues, students, um, this can be really easy or really difficult, and a lot of it just depends on your personal view of what it takes to write a research paper. But do bear in mind that once you've made it this far, you already have a clear question, you already have broad results, and you've already reviewed all of the relevant literature. So you've done just about everything. It's just a matter of writing it down. Um, it's a lot easier than uh, basically starting from scratch with something else. So I'll walk through a quick example of a paper we published last year. We were specifically interested in invasive species, and this is just to show you the kinds of results you can get um, and whatnot, and whether or not these global change drivers, so elevated CO2, uh, rainfall, temperature, um, what sort of effect those had on invasive species. We restricted our search to Web of Science, and in fact, it was just a subset of journals we were considering in that. Um, you can see we whittled down quite a few of the papers. It became uh, just a little more than 10% of the papers. Even though there were 79 papers, we had 98 studies, uh, or 98 pieces of data, and that's because some papers reported data on multiple um, experiments that were done. And we could include both of those pieces of data. And that's something else to bear in mind when you do a meta-analysis that even if you say have only 30 papers, there might be 50 or 60 pieces of data in there that are usable because some papers report results from more than one thing. Uh, it turns out that the data stage was fraught because we forgot to pull certain data, not just once, but twice. So we had to go back through all of the papers twice, which was a pain. Um, and then uh, I just wrote some JAGS code to do a Bayesian estimate. We did log response ratio, which isn't the greatest thing in the world because it doesn't account for variation, but too many of the studies we found did not report anything having to do with the standard deviations or the sample sizes even. And so rather than just chuck all of those out, we resorted to this particular technique um, because it allowed us to use all of the data. And what's cool is you can then get these sorts of, you can ask that question of, okay, do these drivers, do these global change drivers affect invasive species in certain ways? And we see that when we look overall across all of these um, individual studies, that there is an overall effect. Uh, even with those credible intervals, it does not overlap zero. I know it kind of looks like it does, but trust me, it's off by maybe one ten thousandth of one percent. Um, and then we're also able to parse the data. So you can do this with your own data set and ask, well, did aquatic organisms differ from terrestrial ones? Or did the habitat in which the study was conducted um, affect the results? And you'll notice, for example, that aquatic and terrestrial organisms basically show opposing patterns, which means if we're looking for an overall idea, if we're constructing a theory, or if we have particular notions about how these global change factors affect populations, uh, or maybe it's growth, maybe it's something else, um, it's going to matter whether or not we're looking at terrestrial or aquatic organisms. Uh, we can break this down by taxonomy, uh, by feeding guild. These all have effects as well. And so it's particularly fascinating. You can, like I said, parse your data and break it down in these particular ways. Oh, and for any of you interested, when, I, when you see the credible intervals that basically point off the screens, that means they're so broad that, that basically the answer could be anything. Um, but we, I didn't want to throw those off of the figure. You can also parse, your, uh, you know, parse it in this case by the treatment type as well, because we did look at three different drivers of, uh, of uh, global change, whether it was CO2, precip, or temperature. And you can see that each of these has 
similar broadly effects, although you'll notice the one for CO2 is right near the zero line. So you could conclude overall that there's really nothing going on with that. But the minute you look at, say, animals versus plants, you realize that that's why. Increased CO2 has a positive effect on plants and a largely negative effect on animals for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me. Um, but basically, you see different patterns. And so when you pool everything together, your answer is somewhere near the there's no effect um, side. And these were some of the fascinating results we found from this. So the global change drivers did matter. There was a differential response, for example, of plants versus animals, of aquatic versus terrestrial, and guild and habitat had uh, additional effects, which means if we're gonna draw any major conclusions about how global change affects invasive species, it's gonna depend specifically on the context. What sort of ecosystem uh, did we do this study? Are we dealing with an aquatic or a terrestrial organism? Is it a plant? Is it an animal? That sort of thing. Now in those examples, um, and I'm just mentioning this, one of the standard ways you will see in the literature is what's called a forest plot. And this is what we published in that paper. I find them particularly uh, intuitive to understand because you basically just see a zero line for no effect, and then you can plot very easily um, what the effect size that you found was uh, along with the, whatever sort of measure of uncertainty you have. There are, and I'm just mentioning this in passing because I'm assuming that this will be available for you to look at later. Um, there are other ways you can plot results. So I just put these on here so you could see them. There's stem and leaf plots. Raindrop plots are also pretty cool if you can find some software that builds those. Um, you can do violin plots, you could do the labé plots. Um, there are lots of different ways and in something I'll get to in a few slides, they will spend a little, there's one of the chapters in this book, will spend a little time talking about the different ways you can present results. But bear in mind that this isn't the only way to do it, it's just the most common way you'll see it done. So now after all of this and, and maybe all the heartbreak of thinking, um, do I really want to do this? You might ask, like, do I really want to dig through all of this literature? Uh, why, why would I subject myself to that? And well, you could say you could join the bandwagon. Um, Meta-analyses have become increasingly common. These are two different figures from independent data that just shows how prevalent they have become in the literature. Um, especially in ecology, just in, uh, in, in evolutionary biology in the past um, 20 years. Um, there's a selfish incentive. They're cited way more than so-called regular papers. Uh, this one estimate I found said the difference was basically, on average, um, will round up to 27 citations per year versus four. Uh, it's a pretty big difference, and it's because these sorts of papers basically are meant to be an overall statement of what's going on in a particular system or with a particular idea, hypothesis, that sort of thing. I would say there's a big need. If you're confronted with, say, this, the data that I presented early on, perhaps this is our best way to identify something that might be a, a Kuhnian anomaly. Um, Maybe those, maybe it's type one error that you, in a couple of the studies, um, maybe you discovered some other sort of um, issue and there's a very clear answer. Uh, a meta-analysis can nail that down. And if it turns out that what gets nailed down is something that doesn't fit with theory, that might precipitate a crisis in a, in a good way that could actually mean that it will, that, that strong impetus for that so-called revolutionary science and, and something that's going to shift the paradigm. If on the other hand, it turns out that some of the studies that appear anomalous um, really are just straight up anomalous. Maybe they were mistakes. Maybe it was just a weird sample, who knows? Uh, that also ought to come out in the wash in this. 
And also there's just so much published these days. I mean, you know, we can look back into when uh, scientists could basically just have read uh, a half a dozen key books and be up on just about everything. And it's gotten to the point where none of us, it's, it's not humanly possible to keep up with, say, the literature in ecology anymore. Um, there's, there are hundreds of papers published every day, thousands every month. Um, you can't see them all. You can't. And one of the ways that we can, though, keep moving forward with all of this information that's appearing out there is to try to summarize what's going on at various steps and point in that direction. So if you are interested in getting started, uh, find this book. Um, there is a copy, I believe, at the library. Uh, that is correct. We have it physically in Bazell. Um, and right now we're not sure when Sooner Express is going to reopen. So it's inaccessible currently, but you know, watch our watch our page and announcements to see when you're going to be able to access our physical items again. Okay. And it may very well be that there's an ebook of uh, version of this available as well. I don't know. Um, but in any case, I would find that it it is filled with uh, useful and helpful chapters about every single step uh, along the way of how to conduct a meta-analysis, how to screen your data, how to actually pick which effect size is best for you, how to plot everything when you're done, um, that sort of thing. There are a couple of good reviews. Uh, I pulled a couple of figures from them uh, in the course of this that are both pretty short, um, but also I think really good at just getting the point across of what meta-analysis is and why it's valuable. So there's the Gurevich et al. one that appeared in Nature and then the one by uh, Chris Lorty that appeared in Oikos um, yeah, in 2014. And then this is where I had the plug for Claire and, and her brethren um, bit just because I do think it's important to make use of the, the research librarians for assistance on this. And it's not just finding the literature, it could also be helping to conduct some of the analyses if you're running into trouble with R and stuff like that. Um, Claire is really good at helping uh, that sort of thing. So thank you, um, Michael. I will, be, sure. I will be happy to help people for sure. And then that's it for me. And so, hey, look at that. How do we get back to where we were now? In terms of uh, unsharing? Yeah. Um, if you'll mouse up to the top of the screen, um, usually up there, there's going to be a little stop, a red shop, stop share button. Oh, stop share. Yep. There we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was really great. Applause, metaphorically speaking, over the, um, it's hard to get, make that work. So that's, that's really helpful. I, I certainly learned a lot there. Um, it looks like we already have one question in the chat. Um, Bill would like to know, in the example of your meta-analysis, did all of the used studies measure the same values? No, some of them actually measured, uh, say, growth rate, some, if they were plants, some measured biomass, and we just found a way that we could put them, by using something like log response ratio, um, it puts everything basically on the same scale. Great, thank you. Does that answer your question, Phil, or do you have other clarifying questions to ask? No, that's good. All right, thanks, Phil. All right, uh, we have time for other questions here for a few minutes. All right, well, it sounds like we probably don't have any questions right now. Oh, there we got one for, um, from Millen. Um, because the United States and United Kingdom have different terms for the same topic, um, such as saying avian versus bird, would you limit your search term to one specific area or try to be as broad as possible? Generally, the idea, that's, that's a, a good point to bring up, because generally the idea is that you broaden it. You'll have one that's avian, blah, 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 one that's bird, blah, blah, blah. 
And then when you report in your methods section, the search terms that you used, because in a meta-analysis, you, you will be actually really pedantic about reporting exactly which search terms, um, along with the asterisks in there that fill in you know, any match after that. Uh, you might wanna do both just to make sure you pick up all of those papers. Yeah, and I would, I would, sorry, go on, Michael. No, 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 I, that, I was done. Oh, okay, um, I would also add that's something that I can definitely help with um, and any of the other research librarians um, in whatever topic you're doing this meta-analysis in, um, for those who are listening who aren't in one of my departments. Um, so there's definitely, that's something we can really help with and helping you learn how to use the searching syntax in different, like Web of Science is going to be really different than what you do in Google Scholar, and it may have different variations than if you're using ProQuest or JSTOR. Um, so that's definitely something we can help with um, as librarians as well. All right, and we have another question from, or um, Milan, did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, perfect. And then we have another question from Phil. What would be an example of a qualitative question that wouldn't work for a meta-analysis? Uh, anything that basically doesn't, uh, you can't put a number on it. So maybe you see some particular pattern um, and, and boy, you put me on the spot, Phil, I'm trying to think of an exact example of that off the top of my head. But basically we're gonna observe a pattern that you can't put numbers on. Um, and it could be that you could figure out a way to quantify it. Um, but there are a lot of qual qualifiable data out there. And so I'm not saying that there aren't ways to quantify data, but you may find a lot of studies where the researchers, when they published it, only qualified it. And if they only qualified it in their publication, then that's unusable unless you decide to put that into numbers. So I guess I have a related question to that. Would something like that include um, statistical analyses that are categorical, like the contingency table, or is that still going to be numeric enough to be able to put an effect size that on? That is, and yeah, and you can, there are categorical uh, ways to get effect sizes as well. The, the response ratios and odds ratios, uh, relative risk, things like that are basically categorical. Okay. so. Would an example maybe, um, like if you're looking, since we'll use biology examples, since we all have biology thoughts here, um, would that be like natural history data? Like if somebody's saying, but even then I guess you could still get average like bird clutch size or something. So I'm guessing like a behavioral observation would be too qualitative to, to it, do. It could be something like that, or, or it could be that if you're looking at uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, Golia and, and um, my lab and, and along with uh, Amy and Liz are helping with this is looking at uh, dichromatism in birds. And if you find a bunch of literature that simply says, this is a dark morph, this is a white morph, um, that's basically just qualified. And it doesn't mean you can't analyze that, but then you have to think of a way you're going to do that. Okay, that makes sense. And I guess in terms of thinking about other examples, um, if people are doing studies where they get, um, I'm thinking in, in Phil's example, maybe education, if you're getting feedback on surveys from people about how a workshop went or how a class went, like class comments, you'd have to like turn that into counts of words or something. You wouldn't be able to use those, those general patterns because that'd be really hard to turn quantitative, I'm assuming. Very true. All right, any other questions? We've just about hit noon here. So that actually is a great segue for me to bring up that we do have a survey with all of our live events um, that you will get an email um, after about an hour after this event is over. Um, so about one o'clock, if you can check your email and fill out that survey. It's really helpful for us at the library to know um, what events are helpful, why they're helpful, um, any sort of comments you have. Um, so I'd like to say thank you again to Michael. This has been really helpful. I certainly learned a lot today. And thank you all for attending. Um, I will make the recording available online um, within the next few days here. And 
with that, um, I will let y'all go. And again, thank you so much, Michael. This has been really helpful. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was really good. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Claire. See thanks, you guys. Claire. Thanks, Michael. Have a good one. All right. Take care, Cheers. everyone. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you for watching our recorded webinar conducting a meta-analysis by Michael Patton. If you'd like some electronic resources for meta-analysis in addition to the book mentioned in the talk, you can go to guides.ou.edu slash data underscore resources slash design and then click meta-analysis in the menu on your left. Previous videos in this series can be viewed at bit.ly slash ou stim yt. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks for joining us and stay safe out there.